Well, thanks for joining us, and thanks for joining us wherever you're joining us. 92.3 FM, KTAR.com on the KTAR News app. Coming up, Democratic political consultant Stacey Pearson is going to join me. We're going to go around the horn with our reporters who are out in the field. Arizona Secretary of State Adrian Fontes, who's the chief elections officer for the state of Arizona, is going to join us a little after 1. Uh, at one fifteen. Mike Noble of Noble Predictive Insights, the local pollster. Garrett Archer, data analyst with our TV partner. Partners at ABC 15 and the former senior election analyst for the Secretary of State's office. But joining me right now is Republican political strategist, former state legislator Stan Barnes of Copper State Consulting, named one of the top five most influential Republicans in Arizona. And can I say you're one of the my top five Republicans of all time? Yeah. Of course you can. Just as a buddy. On live radio, in front of me in this studio. I love it. Yes, by all means. All right. So, Stan, first let's let's hit the, the most closely watched congressional races for the Republicans. Because you've got two seats that could flip in the fall and one that has almost a 0% chance of flipping. But because of that, has about 300 Republicans running in the primary. <laughs> Uh, I'm talking about Congressional District 8, uh, that seat in Congress that Debbie Lesko is vacating. It is the first race in which I've seen two people endorsed by the same presidential candidate when Donald Trump endorsed both Blake Masters and Abe Hamaday. Yeah, on top of that, I don't believe either of them actually reside in the district, either oh. of those two gentlemen. Wow. So it's kind of remarkable for a lot of reasons. Like you said, whoever wins the primary is most likely going to be the congressman. So it's a ripe opportunity, and it drew in these two candidates that ran last time for other offices. Right. They didn't even move to the district. They didn't even bother to move the district. Blake Masters ran for uh, the U.S. Senate. Abe Hamaday ran for uh, for the attorney general. Yeah, so. they were both the nominees for the Republican Party. Now yeah. they're running against one another. They were good friends. Now they're shooting each other in the kneecaps yeah. on television and on radio, and it's quite a thing to watch. Ben Tomo is the current Speaker of the House. He's from that area. He's trying to step between them and say, these people are crazy. I'm the conservative that actually is not crazy. And I, I don't know how it's going to go. Normally, money means you win in, in raw political terms. But those guys are really annihilating one another. And so we'll have to see if Ben Toma can step through that. Or the former congressman, Trent Franks, who's also in the race and has his known his own latent name identification there. Yeah, I mean, it is one of the most interesting congressional races anywhere in the country. Uh, and then, so there's so many fascinating things about Trump endorsing two people. First off, he did it over the weekend. He added Blake Masters as an endorsement. Um, and a lot of people said, oh, that's way too late. But then you think about people who, you know, follow Donald Trump and they're more likely to actually want to vote in person. They don't trust early voting or mail in ballots in many cases. Uh, and then do you are you do you believe kind of along the lines of what Mike Broomhead was talking about? This splits the MAGA vote and maybe gives I, in my opinion, maybe gives Toma a chance. Yeah, it, I do. I can see that theory. They Every candidate in that race shares the exact same opinion about every big issue. So the only thing to fight about is who's better looking or who's more likable. Who's more or, Trumpy. Or who's more Trumpy. Yeah. And so Donald Trump, of course, endorsed Hamada as for AG and endorsed Masters for the Senate. And Masters has been driving Hamada crazy because he's been acting like until this moment that Trump was with him in the congressional race when he was only with him in the Senate race two years ago. Right. And so there's just kind of like, who does Trump love is the separating factor in that race. Yeah. And Ben Toma, as I say, one of the most decent individuals you've ever met in, in po politics, really a great person as a human being, trying to be an adult in, in that very difficult environment. I don't, I don't know if he has the uh, profile, which to pull that off, we'll see. Yeah, interesting backstory. Didn't speak a, a lick of English until he was like, what, five or six? Yes, right. You know, immigrant to this country. And um, yeah, very, very interesting guy. So uh, how about Congressional District 6? Uh, this kisses the southern part of the valley, despite being the first Mexican-born member of Congress from Arizona and a border hawk. You've got Republican Representative Juan Siscomani facing a primary challenger in Kathleen Wynne. A uh, think tank named Siscomani as the most bipartisan member of Arizona's congressional delegation, which would seem to be a plus in a district that's almost evenly split among Republicans, Democrats, and independents. And he has Trump's endorsement. So does Win stand a chance today? No, no I don't believe so. Okay. I'm a Siscomani fan. I just want you to know up front, your listeners, I'm a big fan. This guy is... 
I think, is a, a, a emerging leader on the state level in Arizona. He is diplomatic. He's smart. He's got a great backstory. He's got discipline. He's got a beautiful family. I mean, he's right out of the central casting for what you want in, yeah. in a Republican a border elected official, a great person. I think he's going to uh, handily win the primary. The general election is going to be uh, the more of a challenge for him, and that's another day. Yeah, uh, the really interesting thing about uh, about the whole Siskamani story is the fact that he can say, I've been through the process. As an immigrant, you know, becoming a naturalized citizen, I know what the system's like. It is a mess and it needs to be changed. But we got to start with security first, as, as a Republican should say. That's what he says. He was born in, born in Hermosillo and is really just about the coolest guy in person. And, you know, he ran for the legislature and lost. Can't tell you you're a fan of No, can you tell? <laughs> I mean, he ran for the legislature and lost and, yeah. then, came, and then worked for Doug Ducey and now he's back. Uh, you know, which is an, an, another indication. He didn't just, like, give up after he, he lost a legislative race. Now he's a congressman. If you go back, he's on the Appropriations Committee in the U.S. House. A yeah. very big deal. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking he's going to have a good day today. Uh, we are talking with uh, Stan Barnes of Copper State Consulting, uh, picked as one of the top five most influential Republicans in Arizona. I'm Jim Sharp. You're listening to a primary day special and, and watching uh, along as well here on KTAR News and at KTAR.com. So let's talk about uh, Congressional District 1. Uh, a lot of people see Republican Congressman David Schweikert as, as vulnerable in a district that's kind of drifting slowly to the left. Six people are running in that Democratic primary, but a lot of them are centrist or former Republicans like uh, Marlene Galan Woods, uh, the widow of former McCain ally and, and our mutual friend Grant Woods, uh, the late Grant Woods. Who, who do you see emerging from that field? And I, I, I wish I had any special insight, but I, I regrettably don't. I mean, there, there's some real candidates in that uh, Democratic primary, some with real money. Like you can't get away from churny ads yeah. on, on television yeah, and, 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 and in pictures with him and Obama and him and Clinton and and he's run before for statewide office, Cherney has, and has his own name ID. But uh, you can argue for every one of them, including Amish Shaw, who's a former legislator and a very centrist oriented and smart medical doctor. Apparently have voted for Trump. That's what they asked. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, and so in that race, and like in many other Democratic races, there's kind of a finger pointing of, of you're too close to the Republicans, therefore you're not a real Democrat. Ironically, as you were pointing out earlier, you need to be more of a centrist to win that district in the first place. So Democrats that are centrist can be better general election candidates. But we might not get that. We might In that district, you might get the guy that's got the biggest D behind his name or the more liberal slant because that's how primary voters go. Remember, David Schweikert has his own primary. I mean, yeah. he, he's got, I think, two opponents in yeah, his primary. Yeah. But he, he should coast right through that. I mean, he's, he's been underestimated for years and always continues to win elections. So that's going to be a very interesting uh, seat to watch. Yeah, it used to be funny. I actually would text uh, the congressman and say, hey, just so you know, because I know it's razor thin, my wife voted for you. You know, and we get a laugh out of it because he used to be just completely safe. It's called sucking up. <laughs> and, and, and very nicely done. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think there's... Any poll which gives Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb any chance to beat Carrie Lake in today's Republican Senate primary and then face off against Ruben Gallego in the fall. Considering all that Lamb has done to fight drug and human traffickers, keep the border in the spotlight, as a Republican, is that a little disappointing to you? Well, I, I know them both so well that that I get confused with my own you know personal relationships. So, But the answer is yes. The lesson here is... The best person doesn't always win. And that, that is a truism in life. It is a truism in politics. Lamb is a great candidate, right out of central casting with his yeah. height, his cowboy hat, his Absolutely. Pinal Sheriff swagger. But, you know, he doesn't have $5 million to tell voters who he is. And he's running against one of the most attractive, dynamic candidates we have seen in our lifetime in Kerry Lake, even if she did lose the governor's race. Um, so it, I don't know how he overcomes that in this primary. Kerry is most likely going to win it. But it's not because Lamb is lacking. It's just because he's running against Kerry Lake, who's got 100% name identification and a great deal of energy and, of course, Trump's endorsement. And, and all that together is she's going to be the nominee.
Uh, you've served in both the state Senate and the, the state House, uh, and you are at the legislature quite often, you know, uh, helping out your Copper State consultant clients. Um, any particular legislative races that uh, we should have our eye on today? Yeah, in terms, of, in terms of primaries, there's a couple of really important Republican ones. One is in Tucson area in southern Pinal County, where a senator, his last name is Wadsack, is running for re-election, and the guy she defeated... Uh, former Senator Leach is running against her, so it's a rematch. And, you know, the, the Capitol crowd in Phoenix is, is really pulling for Leach. He's a Chamber of Commerce kind of reasonable, very nice, thoughtful individual. And uh, Senator Wadsack is not those things. She's an entirely different political animal. So that one might determine the majority makeup in the state Senate, because there's some thinking that if Wadsack is reelected in the primary, that she cannot hold the seat in the general election. If Leach wins, then he can hold the seat and Republicans might hold the state Senate because of that particular district. The other one is the Wendy Rogers, uh, David Cook race, which is Senator Rogers out of Flagstaff and Tempe. Yeah. And Cook, who's out of Gila County, and uh, he's challenging her. He was in the House, challenging her in the Senate. There's That is a very interesting race as well. Yeah, um, I, I still have to say the last race you mentioned, I think a lot of people are saying Leach and Wadsack are not exactly great names for politicians. <laughs> just no offense to there them. There are better names. <laughs> I'm just I'm like roll off your tongue, you know. <laughs> so uh, they, they, I hope that they both win uh, the primary because I don't know as though they stand a chance, uh, you know, in any subsequent elections. Uh, any any surprises you see today, Stan Barnes, as we wrap up our time with you? Uh, the you know, surprises. I we always get something. I mean, that Maricopa County recorders race with Richer is yeah. going to be very interesting to watch. Yeah, uh, given the 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 suffering he's had at the hands of the Trump oriented uh, activists, it's going to be very very. It's going to tell us something about Maricopa Republicans if he survives that or not. It's a three way race, so the anti Richer vote is split among two people. That might save him, but no one I know knows what the outcome is actually going to be in that in that very important race. Hmm. All right. Uh, it's all going to be interesting to watch, including what feels like sharks circling in uh, in CD1, uh, smelling a little blood in the water. So all everybody showed up to, to circle uh, David Schweikert in the, that Democratic primary and uh, and CD3. Uh, that is a very, very interesting primary, but that's. That's the Democrats. So I'll let uh, I'll let our next guest uh, talk a little bit more about that. Joining me right now is my friend and Democratic political consultant Stacy Pearson, co-founder of Lumen Strategies. I'm just kissing up to all the all the guests today, just so you know. I was all, <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It was all like uh, you know, I stand is one of my favorite people. <laughs> uh, but we actually worked together. We did. Yeah, and we spent the recession together. There's nobody I would rather spend the recession <laughs> together <laughs> than you, and, sir. And it's strangely, uh, even though we kind of worked opposite sides of uh, of the office um we were the, the only two sane people there uh, 100%. felt like at times. we were the yeah. only one most yeah. times yeah. all times really there are a bunch of democrats today hoping to get into congress some who are taking the first step in an attempt to to replace a republican in the house those who will essentially take their last step because winning the Democratic primary means it's almost a given that they'll win the general election in a solidly district, uh, you know, solidly Democratic district. So yeah. uh, case number one in that scenario is Congressional District 3, which sprawls from South Mountain up north to Glendale, runs from the edge of Tempe to the edge of Tullison east to west. And uh, there is a CD3 Republican primary that we won't even talk about because the real <laughs> race is between former Phoenix City Councilwoman Yasmin Ansari and, and former state senator and state Democratic Party chair Raquel Tehran, and they've been having a nasty battle in this uh, Democratic primary, accusing each other of being Republicanish. Oh, it's been such an ugly race, and so unfortunate that it got that knife fighty. Um, because ultimately, neither of those women are MAGA extremists. <laughs> They're both very progressive. They yeah. run on very progressive principles. They're up in they're in one in Ansari's case, she's a young rising star in Democratic politics. In Raquel Tehran's case, she's been around for quite some time in the state and has helped elect a number of officials we consider to be our pride and joy. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a 
unnecessarily nasty. Uh, so any predictions as to who replaces Ruben Gallego in Congress? Uh, my money is on Ansari. Okay. And it, for a variety of reasons, the least of which is that um, she already represented this district. She ran on climate change. In, in the city council. At, for city council. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching that campaign unfold for city council and thinking climate change to this district. I, I'm not sure that's the top priority. And she pulled it off in in a very contested race for council, too. And much of the same accu- accusations were thrown at her then. So I, I think she comes out on top. This is a district, too, that was uh, traditionally held by one of the most liked people uh, in all of Washington. Uh, yeah. Ed Pastor yep. was just such an amazing guy, uh, you know, left a, a great legacy in Arizona. I remember when he was getting ready to retire, Republican Congressman David Schweiker said, I'm so sad he's leaving because he's such a great guy to work with. Yeah. Um, this is this doesn't bode well for the Democratic Party, though, that they're, as you said, knifing each other. I think they'll settle down after this. After this. Obviously, after this primary. Yeah. And then the person that takes the seat, when Ansari takes the seat, she's going to have a lot of work to do to to bring that district back to the Democrats. So, so many of the working class families there stopped voting for Democrats, started voting for Trump. It's the place, that's the district that Trump gained ground between mm-hmm. 2016 and 2020. And so she's got her work cut out for her. Yeah. Uh, a lot of Hispanics have seemed to, Latinos have seemed to move over to Donald Trump. And I, I think for a lot of the same reasons that every uh, American that has kind of drifted towards Trump has done it for, whether you agree with the idea or not, right. you know, it's it's the economy. Like, all of us care about our home, uh, what's going on in our house. And there's, uh, I think the scariest words in American politics are, at least he's doing something. <laughs> and we saw yeah. that with Arpaio. People were like, I don't care what he's, I don't care that he's arresting folks, American citizens, based on the color of their skin. At least he's trying something. And so uh, in large part, I think Donald Trump's picked up ground in that district under that same umbrella, that very terrifying umbrella. Mm -hmm. We're uh, speaking with... Democratic political consultant Stacey Pearson of uh, Lumen Strategies here on our primary day special. Uh, speaking of Ruben Gallego, he is the only one running in the Democratic U.S. Senate primary. Uh, he's got to be happy, though, that Carrie Lake is going to win the Republican Senate primary because polls show he could beat her by a good size margin this fall. But I wanted to ask you if, if running against a border focused candidate like Lake becomes tougher for Gallego with Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket. Uh, because the border is definitely topic number one that the Republicans are using against Harris. And against everyone, right? Really against every yeah, Democrat that runs. Fair enough. I think Ruben's exceptional because his service to the military, right? So Ru- Ruben is the, ex- is the exception to those attacks because he has defended this country very literally, right? He served in Iraq, and so I think he's got a leg up on those attacks, but it's still, this is... The, if we think the knife fight among the Democrats in CD3 is bad, this this is going to be um, very difficult to watch and to listen to for the next few months. If, if you were consulting Gallego, would you say, uh, dear Lord in heaven, don't let Mark Lamb win this primary? Well, we can look at what happened with that Felicia Rodolini race when she was running for AG mm-hmm. a number of years ago. And yeah. she started running really hard against Tom Horn, mm-hmm. knocked him out of the primary and a guy with no vowels in his name won. No yeah. one had ever heard of. It was Mark <laughs> Brnovich yeah. wound up right. <laughs> taking yeah. that top spot. No one knew who he was yeah. or how to beat him. And you know, it, nobody was better than, than uh, Tom Horn. So I think, uh, I, I think that, Lake had such a large lead. We're not, we don't need to be concerned about that, but it certainly could have happened. I think it, with some, if, if there was an earlier investment, I think Lamb could have taken her. She's that disliked. She does not have high favorability ratings. No. I, I, will, I will say that much. No. Uh, while we're on the subject of the Senate, let, let, let's hit a non primary topic mm-hmm. if we could for just a second. If Mark Kelly is offered and accepts the Democratic VP nomination and the Dems retain the White House this fall, which Democrat? Does Governor Hobbs appoint to that to that seat? Oh, I've been starting my own rumor. 
about Chad Campbell, the governor's chief of staff, primarily because <laughs> he was my business my partner. Business partner. <laughs> <laughs> and I joke that, look, they could just leave the suits in the closet. Mark Kelly could for Chad. It'd be fine. It would be a very easy transition. He could go right in. It'd be he's great. not a tall man either. Is yeah, that no, what you're he's, saying? He's not, okay. you know, he's got his head shaved. There's, there's a lot of similarities. You know, 50 percent of voters aren't paying that close of attention. They wouldn't even know. It's, you know Chad's he, never been Chad, in space. He's never been yeah, in space. He's never right, been right, in space. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, he could pull it off. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's really fun to actually run through Arizona's bench and see how deep it is for the first time in a long time. Look, it's been 20 years since we held the governor's office. And when Napolitano got called up, we didn't have a big bench. And it took us 20 years, really, to get back in yeah, there, yeah. to get back on the ninth floor. And so it's really fun to see it, it, Raquel Turan and Yasmin Ansari and 450 people and CD1 running against one another. It's it's really fun to see this. Who emerges from that that race uh, that, that would end up taking on Schweikert then in the fall? Oh, I think this race is going to be fantastically close. So I think this is going to trigger the automatic recount. At least that's the polling that we're seeing. Um, but we're going to find out whether or not being a, the only woman in the race has a distinct advantage. And in that case, it's Marlene Galan Woods. Uh Um, Or if yard signs are the key to success in Arcadia. And in that case, it's going to be Amish Shaw. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Who uh, apparently voted for Trump. And that's a big secret. Right. right? Uh, Any legislative races we should keep an eye on today? Oh, I heard um, when I was walking in, you guys talking about Wadsack. I think those are going to be the Wadsack and Leach. Yeah, Uh, Wadsack and Leach are the ones that I'm paying the closest attention to. That sounds like a law firm. It doesn't sound like Uh, any winning game. Sorry. And and I drive an electric car. I was running low on battery and I did not even think to drive 70 down my neighborhood street so (laughs) she taught me something (laughs) I had no idea Uh, but the legislature matters it really does matter Uh, way more than people ever give it credit for everybody of course concentrates on an election year when you got a president uh, running and a vice uh, now a vice president running and a former president running but uh, this stuff if all politics are local it's hard to get much more local than the legislative districts. This matters most. I, I very sincerely believe that. And you look at the issues that are on top of mind for voters right now, um, be it the economy, be it house house prices, um, it, it, abortion, for the love of God. If not for the legislature, we would be under the rule created before light bulbs. Good I mean, point. We're, I mean, it's, it is that personal. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Stacy always... Awesome stuff. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for coming down to the studio. Let's take a couple of minutes to check in with our reporters in the field on this primary day. And let's start with KTAR's Colton Krolak, who's at the Maricopa County Tabulation and Election Center in downtown Phoenix, where the counting happens. Uh, I wanted to start with you, Colton, so you can go get a nap because uh, you were on Arizona's Morning News with Jamie West and me at 530. Yes, thank you. I need it. Yeah, you'll be back in the saddle this evening for more of our coverage. And then you're back on Arizona's Morning News with us tomorrow. So... Let's uh, let's get to this. Uh, since about 80 percent of votes have already been cast through early voting, uh, the election workers you are with at the Tabulation and Election Center have already been counting votes for a, a few days. Am I right? Yep, absolutely. So um, it, it, they've been counting all of those early ballots that came in before Friday. There's about 500,000 of them. Uh, the bulk of those, I've been told, have been counted. They've been signature verified. They've been tabulated. And those are going to be uh, dropping around 8 p.m. tonight, the, those results. And that's going to be the bulk of them. And then about 30,000 people have shown up to the in-person voting locations so far. So about 30,000 of those. And then like I said, about 500,000 early ballots. The majority of those have already been counted. Uh, you know, one of the complaints we hear is that results don't come fast enough on, on election night, but it's the early voters who decide to turn in their ballots in person who are really gumming up the works here. And it's not the, the fault of the elections department because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they're required by law to verify every signature and then count those votes, Colton, right? Yep. I mean, every single one is counted. Uh, you know, every vote matters. So no matter how long it takes, that's that's going to be how long it takes them to get through it. And like I said, those those early ballots that came in before Friday, those are already done. Yeah. And then those votes, the, the people who go into the voting locations, all of those are tallied up uh, tonight heading into tomorrow. It's really the 
other votes, the early ballots that didn't get put in the mailbox on time, those still need to be signature verified. Those still need to be cured if the signature can't be verified and counted. All right. Uh, once again, Colton Krolak, who is joining us this uh, afternoon from the Maricopa County Tabulation and Election Center. Now let's uh, take you over to uh, KTAR's Ballon Overstoles, who is, uh, tell me exactly the location you're at, Ballon. You're at uh, one of the voting locations this morning, this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, I'm at a voting location. I'm at Chandler Gilbert Community College uh, okay. yeah, right here in Chandler. Okay. Uh, and you've been to some other locations throughout the, the, the morning and this afternoon, right? No, this is the first one I went okay. to for my reporting. I will say I looked on the map, you know, to see what's around, and this was the busiest one I was able to find. Okay. So uh, so would you describe the turnout, the in-person turnout at this location, steady, coming in spurts, or, 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 or slow? How would you describe it? I think I would stay steady. I mean, just now, right before you brought me on, about five people walked in. There's people walking out as I speak. It's been a steady stream of people going in and out. I suppose lunchtime's a good time to go uh, get that voting out of the way if you haven't already, you know, voted at your kitchen table and mailed it in. Uh, one of the other things I want to ask you about is, is security, because uh, Deputy Chief Frank McWilliams of the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office told told uh, Jamie West and me this morning that, that we wouldn't see uniformed deputies stationed at polling places, but that does not mean that some wouldn't be called to a polling location or that some wouldn't show up maybe in plain clothes. Have you seen any obvious law enforcement presence? Doesn't have to be sheriffs. Have you seen any law enforcement presence there where you are? No, I have not seen any law enforcement presence uh, really at all. Um around here you know i can't obviously go closer because of the uh, restrictions but right. you know standing around there's uh, there hasn't been any presence yeah you got to stay outside of that 75 foot uh, area there uh yep. <laughs> you know so uh, reporters uh and anybody who wants to electioneer <laughs> whatever that means and yeah. there is one here uh, there is somebody handing out flyers and uh, are, are they just hollering to vote for somebody now he's got some flyers. He's grabbing just about everybody who goes in. He's, he's rallying support for our, some people on the Chandler City Council. Okay, very good. Uh, that is KTAR's Ballon Overstoles, just uh, one of the many people we have out in the field today and we'll have on the air here on KTAR. Uh, the results, we'll start to see that coming in about 8 o'clock. Let's uh, grab a couple of minutes here with the current Secretary of State for Arizona, Adrian Fontes, who uh, serves as the Chief Election Officer for the State of Arizona. Uh, I wanted to ask you if we've heard of any problems anywhere in Arizona's 15 different counties, uh, or is it so far so good for primary day in Arizona? Yeah, first, thanks for having me. Ooh, I think you got to turn that on. There you go. There we go. Okay, first, uh, thanks for having me. And, sure. Uh, you've got an auspicious lineup this afternoon. I, I Mike know. and Garrett. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <Yes. laughs> uh, yeah, we did have a paper jam. Uh, there was a printer with a paper jam. What? And it caused a little bit of an issue. Uh, we also had a gas leak in a building. I don't know that it was on the same side of a rather large building where a polling place was in one of our counties. But uh, that was cleared up pretty quickly. It didn't have any impact at all. Uh, pretty much it's been, uh, you know, an eventless day, except for the fact that uh, democracy is happening as it ought to. Um, we don't have any major incidents anywhere in the state, so I feel pretty good about the way things are going. Yeah, D breathing a sigh of relief that uh, there's not going to be anything for anybody to come back and challenge the results at this point? Oh, well, they're going to challenge stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, these folks these folks don't care about the fact that Americans and Arizonans are voting. They're enjoying a little bit of time with their neighbors. They're saying hello to Mima and Peepaw who are out there working the bowling places. Uh, yeah. They don't care. They just want to cause problems and pretend like the sky is falling because that's how they make their money and that's how they get their political points. And, you know, those are the games that some people play. But for the rest of us, in reality, things are going just uh, just very smoothly. Thank you very much. Uh, as we say in the business, I promoed this, uh, that you would have a little bit of breaking news for us about how uh, <laughs> democracy is blooming and is running smoothly in a very remote spot in Arizona. Well, one of the things that we've always been challenged with in Arizona is the fact that we have some very, very remote uh, polling places and voting locations. And yeah. one of the things that we enjoy here in the Valley, for example, is vote centers where anyone can vote anywhere. Well, to do that, you have to have the technology that can check and see, A, whether or not the voter has voted, and B, which is their appropriate ballot style, because there are a variety of different ballot styles right. uh, for Fed-only voters, for example, different districts, different uh, congressional districts, et cetera. Um, and so we are now able, with some new technology, to support uh, checking folks in with something other than paper ballots 
down in Supai Village, Coconino County. In the bottom of the Grand Canyon. In the bottom of the Grand Canyon, the very place where you got to, we used to haul in and out stuff by a mule, which we still do. Yeah. Um, but we, I think a lot of the stuff is brought back and forth by helicopter now. But we do have the ability now to live link up uh, into our voter registration systems. Now, this isn't the ballot system. It's not the tabulation system. Those are not... Uh, hooked up to the internet, but uh, we those can, will be have to pack pack mule out. Those <laughs> the ballots will be packed out, <laughs> and they will be tabulated in Flagstaff at the Coconino County Election Department. But uh, it's a great, uh, you know, when I found out today that we were connected down there, I just kind of did a little fist that pump. Is, I feel good about that. That is cool. It yeah, really is. so we, we're getting stuff done, right? And I feel really proud of all of the counties that are doing things. I feel so proud of my team that's been able to get the resources out there. We've got a fellows program where we have uh, college students and recent grads who are out there in the election departments working. We're footing the bill, but they're working for the election departments. And let me tell you something. If you've got an election department that has three or four employees, mm -hmm. adding an extra body, a full-time employee, oh, yeah. can make a massive difference for your voters. And that's the goal, right? So we're getting things done. We're having a great election day so far. And, you know, I'll knock on wood to... Hope everybody has, uh, you know, a uh, big turnout and uh, wide margins. That's that's the prayer for elections officials. Well, especially in, in places, you mentioned it, Coconino County, where, uh, you know, where I lived for a number of years before I graduated high school. You where played I football up there, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, well, Page High. But before that, it was in Miami Valley. That's in Navajo County. But uh, so... You know, have, and by the way, Coconino County is the second largest landmass county in the entire United States behind San Bernardino it's, County. Yeah, and a matter of fact, Apache County is the longest north to south county in the that United States. That wouldn't surprise me. That's yeah. really interesting. It's, it's 208 miles from tip to tip. Yeah, so you've got to drive these long distances. You've got to, so yeah, you're right. To have an so, extra body would really, really help. So these folks out there that are running elections at the counties, because they're the ones that run elections, are doing an amazing job. I'm so grateful to them, and everybody ought to be. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, at our conference earlier and every time I go out there, I tell people, look, when you go to vote, exhibit some grace, exhibit some patience, and exhibit some, you know, civic togetherness, right? Uh, they're just there to help you vote. Uh, so be kind to them. They'll be kind to you, and everybody can just get along. When you were on with uh, Jamie West and me earlier this morning on Arizona's Morning News, uh, you mentioned this, but I think it's worth mentioning again. Uh, primary day in Arizona um, is, um, well, what do you need? When you go to vote, what do you what do you what should you bring with you when you show up to a, a polling center? So first and foremost, if you haven't mailed your ballot back, don't put it in the mail, please. Right. Do not put it in the mail. It's got to be in the hands of the elections official, not the post office by 7 p.m. tonight. Take it to a polling place or a vote center near you. If you are going to vote today, make sure that you've got the appropriate identification. There's a whole list of stuff at Arizona.vote. Again, that's Arizona.vote, where you can see what forms of identification are acceptable so that you can go cast your ballot in person. And the last thing is, please, please, please get in line before 7 p.m. If there is a line, and there probably won't be too many, because turnout we're not really expecting to be too high uh, this time around, but if there is a line, you got to be in the line by 7 p.m., uh, and if you've got your ballot by mail uh, ballot that's in the envelope, you can just walk up to the front and they'll tell you where to drop it. Yeah, and that way you, you avoid the the frustration of showing up and not being able to vote if, if you got it yeah, all got, buttoned yeah. down before you get there. Make sure you got your stuff with you, um, and you can go to Arizona dot vote for that information. It, it seems to be mundane. It seems like things are going smoothly, but uh, you've been watching elections since your grandfather was. You know, elected mayor of Nogales, right? Um, yeah, 1979. Wow. Uh, do you see this one being any different than past elections? Or maybe uh, that's a better question is, how is this election different than past elections? Look, I don't think we've had any major differences. We do in, have a calendar difference because normally we have our primary in August. Well, it's normally in August. This time it's July 30th, so we're near, we're August uh, adjacent, I guess you <laughs> okay. could say. We're a week away from But here's here. the thing. Yeah. Our elections in Arizona have pretty much run the same way for decades Right. The only thing is, at one point in the not too distant past, everybody just got all upset for some reason. Mm -hmm. And there's never been any real significant changes to the way we do things. It just all of a sudden people really got interested. Most of the folks I think who are interested didn't understand much about the system and are discovering how secure, how transparent, how open and how free our elections are. And I love the fact that they're asking those legitimate questions. 
But there are people out there who are still grifting off of the idea of the big lie. They're still getting in the way of people voting. And that has created some really hostile environments, particularly for some of our election workers and even now a little bit for some of our voters. So I'm hoping that those people will just kind of back off a little bit and understand that the game is up. Everybody knows that that's kind of just full of it allegations. None of that is really real. Uh, and we can just get along with the rest of the business of America, which is doing business. Go about, do your thing. Because uh, cause we've had this going well for a long, long time. We've been very open and transparent for pretty much forever. Uh, and, I, and I hope we stay that way. I had you on the AZ Political Podcast right after the Department of Justice uh, had announced that Arizona was number one for threats against election workers and, and, and elected officials who oversee elections. Um, has that improved? And do you see it getting better after, say, for instance, another smooth election today? Well, look, um, you know, many of those threats have been against myself and some colleagues and friends um, yeah. in this space, but Republicans and Democrats alike. None of it has ever been justified. None of it has ever been necessary. And, and none of it is really in the spirit of what it means to be an American, right? In this country, we believe in competition. We believe in giving it your best. And we believe that winners win and losers try harder next time. And for some reason, there's this, there's this sneaking corruption of that American value, right, that has, that, has, that has gotten into our thing that says that if my candidate doesn't win, the whole thing was, was corrupted, and that has led to these threats. Uh, and, 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 and they continue periodically. They, they rise and fall with election news. Um, and it's kind, of a, it's kind of a drag because, look, there's an enormous number of resources now that have to be spent keeping a guy like me and, and, and many other people across the entire state safe and secure. I can't tell you how much money we've actually spent hardening our defenses against this kind of thing. Um, not that we know it's going to happen, but we have to be prepared in case it does, right? So, um, and it's scared a lot of people for no good reason whatsoever. And yeah. that's really the sad thing is that we've done so much and wasted so much time and energy and resources, precious resources. Um, and some people have really competent, solid people have had to leave the profession because of these threats. And that's really sad. So, you know, the direct message for folks out there who believe that threats of violence make sense, I'll just tell you this, you know, that's what people in Afghanistan did. That's what people in Iraq did. Terrorists believe that making threats of violence is an okay way to act. Mm. And I'm calling you out right now, folks. You want to make threats against elections officials who are just doing their jobs without any real evidence that there's a problem? You're doing it wrong. Right. And, and no one's going to put up with that. That is Secretary of State for the state of Arizona, Adrian Fontes, the chief election officer for the state of Arizona. Thanks for uh, taking time with us today. I'm glad everything's going smooth, except for that one giant paper jam. I mean, Sorry. look, it took three and a half, four minutes to, 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 to take care of, so we're, we're working on that. Okay. We're working on timing. Thanks <laughs> for right. having me. Well, what we're seeing, I think Garrett will probably uh, dive into this a little bit more because I think he's coming on after me, mm -hmm. is that... Uh, you know, basically turnout wise, at least if you look at, you know, uh, where turnout is right now in the primaries is lower than it was the last uh, two elections um, at the same time, at least for early votes, which, you know, historically, uh, since what, back in 2004, 2005 time frame, we're early adopters of early voting. And that's really caught on where majority electorate uh, typically voted that way, roughly 80 percent or so. Mm -hmm. However, in the last two, four years, because of election integrity stuff, some of the, it's becoming a political football. You've seen some of the voter behaviors change, especially among uh, Republicans of voting. And we see that voting is kind of lagging behind where it was previously, which means one of two things, which we won't know until the dust settles uh, after tonight and the rest of the votes get counted. But it's either A, we're going to have a lower turnout than previously, which is likely due to, you know, the hyper partisanship and kind of independence getting turned off and not voting in the election. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the second part, part part of it, or the second uh, result will be that, you know, turnout is just uh, uh, lower or depressed because it, it's not as competitive, at least, uh, you know, statewide uh, as it is, especially, you know, two years ago when we had all the statewide offices up. I mean, you really only have uh, U.S. Senate uh, for statewide right now. Right, the only right. thing kind of dry. And then some of these microcosm congressional districts so do you think adding back in the presidential election, the, you know, what's what's 
It was known commonly as a presidential pre- preference election. Well, it's actually the official mm. title. But adding back in a, a presidential primary would get people a little more excited and we, we would see a little bit higher turnout. Because I got to tell you, ever since I was able to vote, uh, and I've worked in the media almost that entire time, um, mm. I'm told this is the most consequential. This is the most important election of our lifetime. <laughs> and, if, and if voter turnout seems to be getting lower and lower... That just doesn't make sense, right? Well, well, I, I think it's kind of like the the boy who cried wolf, right? That uh, uh, old uh, tale is old as time. But you know, you, you're hearing that, and they've said that. You're right. The, uh, this is the most important election. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I know they've said that a bunch, but here's the thing. Based on the data, based on the stuff I've been looking at, it is unequivocally the most important election Arizonans have ever faced. Like. Arizona five years ago used to be a ruby red state. Republicans had a dominant control over the state. However, the state is in literally competitive up and down the ticket. We may decide who sits in the White House for president, may decide who controls the upper chamber in Washington, U.S. Senate, may decide who holds Congress. But then even the state legislature, who's going to you know have the state House, state Senate, which is crazy because uh, Democrats haven't controlled both legislative houses in Arizona for about four decades. Uh, and yet... Uh, Republicans only have a two-seat advantage in the state House and the state Senate. Mind you, we have a governor, a Democratic governor, who's not up this year. She's up in two years. So imagine if Democrats were able to give both chambers and they have a Democrat governor, how much public policy could shift in a short amount of time oh, yeah. in Arizona could be massive. And again, whether that's good or bad depends on how you view it. Uh, you know, but So when you look at it, like, no, this one truly is. But I think to your point is that if we – do see the results of lower turnout, I think it's just a, 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 an advert, it's an effect of basically uh, this hyper partisanship. It's like, it's like two siblings that are just going at each other, and you're just like, I really don't want to be in the middle of this right now. So, so, and do you, so a lot of people step away. So, do you think that, that, that we're going to see, you know, the general election go through the roof? Like, because of, oh, yeah, 100%. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, no. And, and back to your, sorry, I realized I didn't answer your question was that, yes, absolutely putting the presidential, I know they do the preference, right? But if you were to align that with the primaries, let's say you did the Democrat one and the Republican one at the same time as our primaries here, mm-hmm. absolutely that would impact because, you know, turnout is going to be around 30, 35%, which would be significantly higher because, you know, that's the big ticket. That's the most and just that it's that's the ball game for right. for a lot of voters is the presidential contest. We we were talking with uh, Mike Noble of Noble Predictive Insights, a public opinion polling firm. Uh, earlier, we were talking with the Democratic political consultant uh, Stacy Pearson, and she said about Democrat Ruben Gallego facing off against Kerry Lake uh, in the likely matchup this fall in Arizona's U.S. Senate race um, that you know that's a good thing for him. It's better that he <laughs> face Lake. Uh, as a Democrat, then it would be facing Lamb. But uh, two questions about the, the Republican primary. Did it surprise you that Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb didn't poll better against Kerry Lake than he did? And will part of Gallego's victory party tonight be celebrating the fact that Kerry Lake won because he prefers to face her? Uh, yeah, so great. Uh, great question. So uh, based on the data, I know a lot of people looking at it, is that based on the data, it's not a surprise where Lake is looking like she's going to come out on top over uh, uh, Sheriff Lamb. And it, I think our last poll we put out yesterday, our poll of record for the race had Lake up by about 12, uh, but which, you know, initial results had her up six uh, among people that have already voted already. So mm. 60% of respondents said, hey, they've already cast their ballot, which is about right. Uh, but then the folks that haven't voted yet or plan on voting on Election Day, Uh, you know, uh, Lake had a much bigger lead. It was like over 20 points. So uh, the big thing with her, the the two issues with Lamb and why it's not a surprise is that uh, name ID. Uh, Lake has like 95% name ID. Uh, She's the Trumpiest uh, of the folks in there are known for that, uh, which is powerful in the GOP primaries in this current age of politics, but also money, Uh, money and earned media. So you can get your message out one of two ways. You can buy it or you can get it for free. Uh, Lamb really hasn't done a great job on uh, getting uh, earned media and also campaign finance wise, Lake has raised five times the amount of money. He, she's raised ten million to his two million. Yeah. So it's just really lack of resources, really. Because remember, to get your name ID up, you you got to earn it or buy it. So if you can't do one of those two things, you know Lake has the advantage um, just because she's more known of a candidate. And then uh, and then Ruben, 
unequivocally, Ruben is hoping, praying right now that is absolutely Kerry Lake because Lake, yes, she's incredibly well known, but when it comes to the general electorate, she's uh, defined negatively. So overall, a lot of people have an opinion, but overall that's not good and that's tougher to move around. Or Ruben still has room to grow and he's going to have the cash advantage. And right now, Ruben has a cash advantage, I believe, of four to one wow. over Kerry Lake right now. He's about $10 million in the bank to two and a half, which... Just think of it this way. It's a big state. It's hard to cover all the ground. So, you know, the you amount of ads with... you can run. Yeah, it makes a big difference. It's a lot of fun, really enlightening uh, so far here on our primary day special. And uh, we're getting ready to get even more enlightened because uh, we're going to say uh, hi to uh, Chris and Joe in a little while. Uh, two guys, I don't even know who they are. Some guys named Chris and Joe. Uh, but right now I want to say hi to one of my favorite math guys because he makes it all understandable. Garrett Archer, data analyst with our TV partners at ABC 15, is the former election analyst uh, for the Secretary of State's office and a guy who's known on social media as the data guru. Uh, uh, I Hello, love Jim. counting. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> can't hear because you know the headphones on i got that oh, we got the count going sorry about that. in the background there so uh, l let's start with your catchphrase a, a catchphrase that has you what, what are you up to like one hundred and twenty-one thousand followers oh the next something like that yeah, something like that yeah when will we see maricopa incoming uh eight o'clock when we're told we'll see the results for uh they'll start to be released do you anticipate any hiccups in that or is the fact that we're looking at about 30 percent turnout 80 percent of ballots cast before today mean results are going to be incoming quick i do not maricopa incoming should come uh at eight o'clock uh that is because as as you pointed out before the um all those early ballots have already been tabulated uh yeah. and uh they're pretty much ready to go so they just have to do a couple things get that card ready to transfer over to what's called the gateway computer and dump those results onto onto the air so explain it to everybody how how that works so the computer yeah the, the, yeah because the, yeah. there's all this talk about oh that's an air gapped computer yes, and are, oh that's gonna connected the internet. to the internet yeah. uh, there is a secured room where all of the uh, uh tabulation let's, equipment let's is. start with if i go and vote in person sure. and i'm going to because i'm an independent i'm gonna uh, go and vote later today uh i walk in and i get my ballot i'm not gonna say which ballot i'm getting uh i fill that out and then they stick it in a box stick there. it in no if you if they you stick go it to in the, the polls, tabulation actually, machine if you go to the polls they actually stick it in the tabulation machine because you have checked in. So when you go and check in mm -hmm. and you verify your ID at the polls, you are done. You're checked in. And so they tabulate that ballot right there. Uh, so that ballot is basically stored as it would be archived later on. But it is it is a tabulated ballot. All right. And then what uh, happens so to what my happens vote then? is at, at uh, seven o'clock when polls close uh, and the last person is voted, they uh, there's a new process now where they're going to actually open that that early ballot, those late early ballot bins when you drop off. If people go and drop off their early ballot and they're going to have to count those at the vote center. So once those are done counting, and by the way, that's going to extend the amount of time we're waiting for results in November. But, but I'm talking about my, my know, ballot I'm, at the, at, I'm, at I'm the not done elections. Yet. Okay, yeah. sorry, sorry, so sorry. I'm not done yet. All so right, right, uh, right. once those are once those <laughs> early ballots are counted, yeah. then they collect all the uh, all the ballots that need to be collected. The tabulation card, uh, which contains the results from the from the what's called the ICP, the tabulator, and they drive that to a receiving point, which then they get to other vote centers, and then a big truck is driven to MechTech with all of those cards. Those cards are all aggregated into the EMS, uh, which is the EMS of the election management server. Then what happens is that data is then put on a secured USB card that has to be like sealed. It's, it's sealed and has to be opened. Uh -huh. to so that it's, they know it's clean. Uh, and then it uh, receives the results and someone walks it to a computer outside of the network that actually does have a Internet connection. Uh, and then that is where the results are uploaded to both the Secretary of State and the Maricopa County results. Wow. Site. Okay. So uh, what happens to my actual paper ballot? Uh, your paper ballot will be stored in a black canvas bag or black bag, uh, and then that will be stored at the warehouse until uh, things are ready to be moved to what's called the treasurer's vault. Uh, and then uh, the that ballot will be retained for a period of, I think, it's two years. Wow. Yep. Okay. So... Uh, they actually do keep the paper trail. Yes. Um, there is no chance for the this this thumb drive or what, is that the best way to describe yeah, the it? Thumb is? Drive, the thumb drive that is that contains the results uh, when it gets from the EMS to that gateway computer, which is the internet computer. Yeah. That is, like I said, it's 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 unsealed right there, so that when they know it's clean because they're opening it up from the packaging. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That makes me feel like uh, it, it seems pretty simple, but, you know, you got them computers involved and all that stuff. I, and mean, I, I don't know. The thing about elections is that it does seem simple because you're just it's 
It's just counting, but there's so much that goes on in the background to make sure that that count is accurate. Yeah. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, how the electorate has changed a, a bit here, because, uh, like, let's talk about Congressional District 1, CD1, uh, Congressman Schweikert's district. Is that the one that's gone, undergone the most change as far as the electorate ma- electric, electorate electorally. makeup? Electorally. Electorally, yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, drifting to the left in such a way that Democrats are like circling like sharks smelling blood in the water, and that's why there's eight of, or 800 of them running? So let's just talk about, yeah, it's, uh, District 1. So in t- I'm looking at this data right now. Uh, in 2012, the presidential candidate Mitt Romney won that district 58 to 41. Uh, in 2016, Donald Trump won that date district 49 to 45. So it's already tightened up to four points. And then in 2020, Joe Biden won that district 50 to 49. Wow. So by more than a point, and that's one of the reasons why the Democrats have gathered and clustered in this district, because that, you know, Schweikert is going to overperform uh, uh, Trump in that district because he has every single time Trump has been on the ballot. Uh, but it's only been by about a point or two when he uh, uh, per- overperforms them, which means there is some blood in the water there. And that's why the, the Democrats are sort of circling that area, thinking that that's one that they can take out. What other congressional districts have changed um, a lot? Spatially, CD, I mean, well, first of all, uh, the, the, the we rural district. The, yeah. the, the, yeah, redistricting. Yeah, CD2, which is the northern rural district, yeah. that used to be a relatively competitive district. In fact, as mm-hmm. you remember, it was uh, uh, represented by Ann Kirkpatrick. Uh, so it was represented by a Democrat uh, last uh, last go around, um, at least for a little bit. But uh, now it uh, has shifted to also including Prescott. Uh, so it right. includes both Prescott and the uh, uh, Flagstaff area. And just with the inclusion of Prescott, that makes that district no longer competitive for Democrats. So that district is, a, is now a solidly Republican district. What we call the River District has not changed all that much. Uh, that is the the. Paul Gosar represents that district. Lesko's district and Biggs district have not changed very much. The one that changed, I guess, the most spatially as far as who's being represented is CD6, Juan Siscomani down in Tucson. Right. Has probably the most new uh, constituents from the previous, oh uh, gosh, I think it was CD2. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that one, that's the one district that's probably changed the most, and it's actually gotten a little more, it's gotten more Republican. as, as you can think. It's Right. Got, it's got a, a Republican Th- representative. That right was now. part of Kirkpatrick's district, and also uh, that was Gabby yes, Gifford's that was, district. That was, uh, and, exactly. Kirkpatrick both represented both CD1, at that time CD1, which is the Northern District, yeah. and the Southern District. Yeah. And yeah, uh, and I'm looking at the same data on CD1, but in CD6, uh, Joe Biden won that district 49.3 to 49.2, so only a oh, half a point dif- wow. difference. Uh, and again, the, the, the rep- representative, the Republican representative, does typically overperform Trump a little bit. And so that's why that district, we're not seeing as many Democrats jumping on, is that the risk is a little bit more than CD1. Right, right, right. Uh, we, we were talking a little earlier with Stan Barnes, um, you know, picked as one of the top five most influential Republicans in the state, right? Uh, and he seems to think that uh, Kathleen Wynne, who's running against Juan Siscomani in that primary there, doesn't really stand much of a chance. But Siscomani does have a bit of a, uh, he's going to have a, a bit of an uphill battle to hang on to that seat. Is, do you see it sure, that I way mean, as well? It's, that, that district is always, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's to me, because I, I just know Maricopa County is so much more, I can, I, I can sort of, Tell what's going to happen in places like CD1. I, right, I mean, right, you right. Kind of tell where the development's happening. Is it is development happening in Republican areas, Democratic areas? So you can kind of for, forecast a little bit. And my forecast is that district does become more Republican over time. Uh, that district is a little more static, and the only growth areas in that district are in the suburbs of Tucson. And that's all I have to really tell you. The okay. suburbs of Tucson. Suburbs, so that yeah. that right there will tell you that growth in that district is coming from. People are, are individuals that are likely more democratic than they would be in if they were choosing to move to North Scottsdale, wow. which is a much more Republican area. Okay, as always, uh, great stuff. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, the data guru. Uh, I got to tell you, I was only handed this slip of paper, uh, and I read it as as is, and uh, I almost <laughs> dropped it when I read this. How the Gilbert goons could influence the election? Is that what you guys are going to talk about coming uh, yeah, up at that's two o'clock? Part of the program, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that uh, specifically at three. Uh, because I do think that the Gilbert Goon things uh, thing is going to have 
some sort of an impact. At least people are paying attention to it when it comes to the Maricopa County uh, Attorney's Office. Mm. And they're trying to figure out, was this prosecuted uh, correctly? Was it uh, aggressively prosecuted? Could it have been done differently? Uh, was it, uh, you know, was the investigation done right? Are we getting, what kind of fallout are we going to see? And really, this is the first election that we've had where we have an opportunity to see if the voters are satisfied with the way that their leadership has conducted themselves. We already know it's cost some seats in Gilbert. Uh, the mayor, forget it, you know, some others. Well, I was going to say, uh, Joe, that I heard, I saw, you know, when I talked to Ballon Overstoles, he was mm-hmm. out at uh, Gilbert uh, Chandler Community College, and somebody was standing outside that 75-foot perimeter, electioneering, yelling about city council races. Oh, huh, right? How about that? I mean, it's, so with Gilbert, you're going to obviously see a new mayor. That mm-hmm. race has been interesting to say the least that the outgoing mayor is persona non grata out there in Gilbert. You're going to see that Chris brought up also what's going to happen with the County attorney here yeah. and everything there. And and we have an update on the case today as well that we're going to dip into for a couple minutes. So that's going on, but we also want to kind of encourage people. I think sometimes we almost look like we look at primary day, like, Meh. listen, there are plenty of reasons that primary day is a bigger deal than the general election. And so we'll, we'll dive into the why that is the case and why, you know, if you're looking at primary day as a warm-up election, I think you're really missing out on something. Yeah. There's uh, there's really something to today. Well, considering the traditional turnout for, <laughs> for primary day, yeah. it is seen as a, as a warm-up. It, like, like it completely I, is. I will say the only elections I've missed over the last few years have been a couple of primaries here and there when I got really busy mm-hmm. or, you know, like a city council kind of election, something like that. Um, and you know, so I, even I'm guilty of it, of, of thinking of it as being less, than, less, less important. Why? I don't know. I mean, why would you? I don't. Just, why no, would I I'm admit not, that on no, the radio? No, 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 no. Attacking you? No, no, no. Curious. No, I want to know. I mean, why? Why is it that? Because you you haven't missed a general election, so obviously you prioritize that differently. Right, right. So why why not the priority on the primary day? What was it at the? Maybe you can't think of the specifics, well, but I think oftentimes these races feel like foregone conclusions, or maybe maybe well, we already know what, the district is going to go one way. In some cases, they are. Yeah, yeah, there's a ton of uh, of races in Arizona today, though, that are not foregone conclusions that have been uh, kind of knife fights. You know, some yeah. nastiness has gone on. And uh, I mean, I don't live in Congressional District 8, but holy <laughs> cow, if I did, man. Got you know? some people being endorsed by uh, the former president making the rare dual endorsement the other day out there. Yes. And you've got, what, six candidates on the Republican six side? Six candidates. Yeah. I saw an ad this morning for Ben Toma, who is, uh, I think he's trying to split the difference here. I think the the logic is uh, if Trump has endorsed Hamaday and half the Trump supporters go to Hamaday and Trump has endorsed Masters and half the Trump supporters go to Masters, Toma may be saying, that leaves everybody else for me. Yeah. that's, you know? that's We were talking about that a little earlier with uh, Stan Barnes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that you can make a case that the MAGA vote gets split for sure. Uh, and then you've got that Whew. It, I don't want to call it a cat fight because I'll sound sexist, but it has been it's been nastiness uh, in, in Congressional District Three, uh, where you've got Yasmin, the former you know Phoenix City Council person. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. going up against uh, Ra- Raquel Tehran. Mm-hmm. It, um, they do not like each other, and actually, Stan Barnes, who was in here earlier, appears in one of the ads. It's like, look who's helping her, you know, because <laughs> they're trying to make each other look like they're Republicans in that, you know. What a bizarre thing, too, are the primaries. And one of the reasons I think uh, it, we should pay more attention to it is that you have Republicans who all the Republicans are going to unite behind the Republicans in CD8, right? Mm-hmm. You have get Democrats, and all the Democrats are going to unite behind the Democrats in CD3. But right now, it gives us an opportunity to see what the differences are even within the party. And they don't like each other. Well, why could – how could they not like each other? They're both members of the same party. But we are led to believe that – that party members are cookie cutter cutouts, right? Right. And that's just not the case. And this is why I love the primaries because we get to see who's not, who's not part of that cookie You get to see a little bit cutter. more of their true colors. Yeah. I like to see what's in the cake a little bit. If there was a primary election on the Chris and Joe show, who would win? <laughs> Why are you trying to drive division between Chris and I, Jim? Well, you know what's funny is when 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 Bruce. Jim, I'm glad you asked that because I respect my opponent, but I think we can all agree he's not suited for the job. I want to see a debate on the Chris and Joe show. That's yeah. what I want to see because I did. I remember uh, a few months ago when uh, when Bruce came back to the station and it said Bruce and Gatos. I'm like, 
So who's the lead on the show? And he's like, there's no lead. I'm like, come on. I'm just think, trying to stir things up. How about this? I think it might depend who you're looking for and when you're looking for it. Chris, certainly more fired up, a little bit more excited about the election. But and if you're looking for milk toast, boring, and not getting anything done, Joe is the guy. Oh. Or if you want more of a Mark Kelly, more of a human potato, but a, a measured, <laughs> sound, bald. responsible leader, bald, you want Joe Huizinga. Wow. Mm -hmm. I Look what I started here. I feel really, really bad. So uh, what is the race you guys are watching the closest that today? That CD8 is to me. I don't know. I'm not, yeah. not going to ask answer for Joe, but for me, it's CD8. No, I, no, doubt of, it, no doubt about it. Yeah. That one all all of the barbs have come out there. You've got all the drama right there. Masters, Hamaday, and what Chris brought up as well. Is there one of those other four candidates who can thread the needle yeah. because the the Trump vote gets split between Masters and Hamaday? Yeah. Mm. Wow. I, I, yeah. Also, I'd, th I'd throw into the county sheriff races as well to see what happens with Maricopa County Sheriff on both sides, contested right. races. Right, uh, because uh, the current, you know, sheriff who was appointed and then, you know, is is running, uh, he was uh, pretty much a lifelong Republican before he re-registered as a yeah. Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so, so was Paul Penzone. I mean, you remember, he was a Republican until he re-registered to run against Pretty much. Uh, I, I don't, I, you know, it's funny. I don't know as though Paul Penzone was a Republican before or if he was an independent, but I do... I, I did call him a dino a couple of times, and I don't think he really liked that very much. But he didn't. He never liked being called a politician either. But I'm like, look, That's you're true. running for political office. You know, whether you yeah. like it or not, you are a, um, a politician. But you have on, to at least on, play one on the radio. On the Republican side of things there, too, you've got Jerry Sheridan, who was a decades-long Joe Arpaio backer. Yep. And you've got Frank Milstead, who had all kinds of experience, not as sheriff but also a police background. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, headed up DPS mm -hmm. and, and uh, was uh, chief in Mesa for a long time. So, yep, there is a lot uh, lot to talk uh, about, and uh, Chris and Joe are going to do that, including, I just have to say it again because it just it just jumped right out at me, how the Gilbert goons could influence the election. you got to listen to the Chris and Joe show to make sure you catch all of that coming up. That's right. Tie up all the loose ends. Yep. Two to four here on KTAR. Cue the dramatic music. <laughs> Good Already. job today, Jim. Nice job. Well, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that.